quench all fiery darts. That's the subject today. And it has to do with the authority and the power that God puts in your hand in the closing days of this um, particular dispensation of time. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the great book of Isaiah. We're going to take chapter 1. And what does, what does Isaiah mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means salvation of Yah, salvation of Yahweh, our Heavenly Father. And naturally, who is the Savior? It's Christ. And uh, foretelling that coming, that gift to mankind that would uh, give us repentance from our sins and give us eternal life. So with that having been said, Isaiah chapter 1, let's pick it up in verse 18 if we may. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, I mean they're bad. They shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson. They shall be as wool, wool being the white of sheep, which is symbolic of his children. That is after repentance, after the Savior, once you repent. Uh, verse 19, for if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And as long as a nation is good and obedient and obeys the law of God, he'll bless them. And the moment they stop uh, being obedient to Almighty God, you can rest assured you're going to have drought, floods, uh, uh, bad economy. It's going to fall apart, basically, in many places. And, well, is that because they're disobedient? Well, I don't know. What do you think? That's what God said. He meant it. Let's reason together. That means use a little common sense. And you are always immune as long as you love him, follow him, and obey him. Verse 20. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, what, what is the sword of the Lord? It lets you know that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. It's the tongue of Christ, which means what? The word of God. The word will devour you. Why? Well, if you don't listen to it. And it would seem that very few people like to listen to it today on a national front. But it's growing more and more so that people are hungry and they're beginning to listen. They want to do what's right. They want to be pleasing to Almighty God, from whom all blessings flow. Verse 21. How is the faithful city become an harlot? That's Jerusalem. It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers uh, on every front, both the good and the bad fig, established there in the year of our Lord, 1948. Verse 22. The silver is become dross, thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with uh, water. Everything you got is weakened and, and, and uh, watered down. Your, your, even your silver is not going to buy what it used to. Dross is that old side kick of uh, gold, silver when you're refining it. It's what the, the, um, the smelter slings out. It's, it's worthless. Not fit for anything. And, and the wine, rather than being pure, to be symbolic of the blood of Christ, uh, is watered down, doesn't get the job done. 23, that is to say, as far as health and the purpose it was intended. 23, the princes, that's to say your rulers, your politicians, are rebellious. And companions of thieves are. Everyone loveth gifts. That means they like to take bribes and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. They really don't care a great deal about the promises that have been made in this great nation to take care of the elderly and to, to provide for those that need aid. Rather, um, it would seem that... Um, they like to become a dependent nation. That kind of smacks of something we sure have, a lot of us have shed blood not to 
go there or to stop communism from approaching in this great nation. I'm not saying that's what we've got, but socialism is the sister of communism. Some of us old boys that have fought it right on the battlefield know what it's about. 24, therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. He's still on the throne. He's going to have his way. You can count on it. It's going to happen exactly as it's written. It's better than tomorrow's newspaper. You read it lately. And I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away the dross and take away all thy tin. That's a byproduct. All your alloys and byproducts that are worthless. We're going with the real thing is what he's saying. We're going to change things back as it was. 26. And I will restore thy judges as at the first. That's judges that go by God's law and commandments. Uh, General law established in, the, in Europe was later brought to this nation in the form of the Constitution, which was taken right from this word. And thy counselors, as at the beginning, they're going to use common sense. They're going to reason together. Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. In other words, it's going to be restored. Any way you want to slice it, that's coming. The misfits might have their day, but their day is drawing to an end because the day of vengeance cometh, and our Father is ready for it. Again, you that obey him, you're immune. You're inoculated to that deception and that falseness, and you rise above it uh, with his blessings. 27, Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness, those that convert to true Christianity, and the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. And of course, God is a consuming fire. Naturally, he's a loving God also. And he waits until the end of the millennium before that consuming fire comes into existence. Meaning what? Meaning all those that had no opportunity to learn the truth from God's word in spiritual bodies through the millennium, not a second chance. They haven't had a chance to start out with. They're going to learn in the millennium. Then comes the consuming fire. God is that consuming fire. Your documentation, Hebrews chapter 12, last verse. And that's when that will transpire. Why? Well, when we go into the eternity, we don't want nonsense with us. We want peace and liberty as it was intended, intended by our Heavenly Father. Verse 29, For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired, and you shall be confounded from the gardens that you have chosen. Gardens are kind of your little paradises, your little churches. The oaks is your grove worship, where you, you, rather than really studying God's word, you find other forms of religion to entertain yourself. And not good at all. What he's saying is false religions will be put an end. It's not going to happen any longer. We're going to have him with us. Uh, grove worship has been a, this is where Ishtar, which is a, a pagan goddess, came to be. And how precious it is to know God's word. Last verse uh, coming up, 30. For you shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth. It's not going to be much. Oak is a mighty powerful tree, but you cut the water off of it and she's a, it, it's, it, it hurts. Leaves fade. And as a garden that hath no water. Have you ever seen one? It's brown and lifeless. That's what false religion will bring you. Not eternal life, but dead, death. Spiritually deader than a hammer they are. Verse 31 to complete the chapter. And the strong shall be as tow, and the maker of it as a spark. 
and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. Nobody's going to put it out. You know, uh, tow is a wick. He said, the, the enemy and, and the false ones are going to be just like a wick, and that old spark, which is God's word, the power, the light, is going to set it off, and when he does, nobody's going to stop it. To quench in the Hebrew means to put out, to take over. Satan tries it. He's not going to make the ripple. But you're going to, you're going to learn how to, to put out and to quench anything Satan might try to start. Turn on with me to the 34th chapter, if you would, of this same book. 34th chapter of Isaiah. And verse 1. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, you people, let the earth hear. And all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. That, that's all inclusive. You want to open up and you want to listen. Verse 2. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. And when you don't do it God's way, you can be in a heap of hurt. You know, God's instructions in the beginning are at a military camp. You even put the straddle trench, which is the, the restroom, we'll call it, outside of the compound. You don't bring it near. And the funny people, you certainly keep 10 miles away from the camp. But things change. And God is not happy. His indignation boils when he sees what transpires in this world today with perversion and other things in a nation founded. When those 10 tribes, which is, makes up the house of Israel, went over those Caucasus mountains, settled Europe, many of them later coming to Canada and the United States of America. Those houses, that true house of Israel, not, we're not talking about the house of Judah here, but the house of Israel. God expects more from it. That's why it's blessed. It's not an accident that this nation has always been blessed. God promised it as long as you would obey him, practice freedom, and stick with this word. The further we grow away from this word, the more his indignation rises. It's common sense. That's why he said, hey, let's just talk about this. Let's reason together. What's wrong? You don't have to look very far to figure that out. Anyone with common sense, you know. So, and so it is that uh, <clears throat> he prepares. Verse 3. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountain shall be melted uh, with their blood. We're moving on here to that time of Haman Gog and Armageddon. Um, and uh, verse 4, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. Satan's going to be cast out right to this earth. And all that host shall fall down, as a leaf falleth off from the vine, and as the falling fig from the fig tree. That's why Christ said, learn the parable of the fig tree. He didn't say maybe. He said, learn it. And that's why the, the year 1948 becomes so prominent, because the wise are supposed to, they'll know, no one will ever know the hour, but you're supposed to know the season. And we're in the season of that old fading fig, big time. <clears throat> and verse 5 reads, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. There is a reason it is written in Revelation chapter 9 that you're to go to the Euphrates and you're look, to look to the east. And the word in the Hebrew is Kedim. It means you can't look there from here. You've got to go there. And you look, and what do you see over there? You see turbine. 
You see Teleban. You see those spoken of by our Heavenly Father. What is Adumia? Adumia in the Hebrew is, is the blood. But it means Edom, which is red in the Hebrew tongue. And it's talking about Russia. Okay. <clears throat> but Edom at the time of this writing was where Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon sit today. He said, you're going to see trouble there. Of course, we've been warned of this over and over. So keep your eyes open. Well, why would God's curse be upon them? Well, what, what do you think? What do they do? How many people do you know that have young people that you educate them in your church to blow their guts out? I mean, that's a little basic and plain, but let's face reality is reality. And truth is truth. Verse 6, the sword of the Lord, that's his word, his tongue, is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra. Well, where is this Basra? Basra means fortress in the Hebrew tongue. And it, where does it sit? Along about Jordan, Syria is, uh, today. And a great slaughter in the land of Edemia when Russia tries to back them up. Well, how can you be sure of that? Because God said it. Okay. It's written. This is going to come to pass. It's yet future from now. But we're getting there. Verse 7. And the unicorns shall come down with them. There's no such thing as a unicorn. And in the Hebrew tongue, this is wild ox. Okay. So you can always correct that. It's wild oxen. Shall, shall, Basra was known for the beast there. Uh, the, shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls. And their land shall be soaked or drunken with blood. And their dust made fat with fatness. Well, it's kind of getting there anyway. It means it's going to be fertilized with blood. Verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's visions and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. It is coming, beloved. What, what do you have to fear? Nothing. You could be right in the center of all this and God takes care of his own. This is why when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into the fiery furnace, they weren't even singed because Christ walked with them. The Savior was with them. As long as you use this, that's your brain, and reason together with Almighty God from His Word and in prayer, you're going to rise above deception because, you know, a man only fears the unknown. And when God lets you know beforehand what's going down, a good man or woman always makes preparation. You're either going to go through it, over it, under it, around it, some way. You're going through. Okay. But that's what the truth does for you. It alleviates anxiety and lets you know your father expects you, as one of his own, to make a stand. To stand for what is right. Common sense. That day of vengeance is coming. When was it coming? Well, no one knows the exact hour, but it's in the generation of the fig tree. And that generation started in the year of our Lord, 1948, when Israel become a nation again. On the map. That set the, that set the fig out. Both good and bad. The good fig and the bad fig. Verse 9. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. Verse 10, to complete our reading here. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now, a little bit of understanding on this. What happens then? What happens at the seventh trump? That's what he's talking about. That's when the vengeance really transpired. We're all, as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 52, we're changed into our spiritual bodies. 
in a different dimension. What happens to this dimension is of none hurt to you. I mean, it's not coming back. That's what he's saying. We're never going back. You know, you can read in the great book of Genesis, way back in the beginning, chapter 6, verse 3, it grieved God that he had now made man flesh also, where man could make his mind up, or, or, am I going to believe in God or am I going to follow Satan? And that's been the controversy coming out the gate. So he, he didn't like it because he had, to, he had created us flesh, but it was necessary to see what you were going to do because he gave you free will. Freedom of choice. But he did send you a letter, this word, telling you how to avert or avoid the pitfalls, how to stay out of trouble, and how to, to fix something after it's broken. That means we all fall short at times. Big deal, all right? But repentance makes correction, and, and you grow by it. And God is able then to use you. How precious it is. That day of vengeance is coming. And what it's talking about there is Haman God and Armageddon. There are two battles that shall be fought not by man, but by God himself. It is written, I will cause hailstones when Russia comes down, Edom. And uh, I cannot... Uh, uh, say other than it is my knowledge uh, that this is going to happen. This is why we bought Alaska from Russia. It's for a burial ground for them. That's where Haman Gog is going to be. Haman Gog is different than Armageddon. Armageddon will have to take place in the Valley of Hinnon outside of Jerusalem. And perhaps I'm putting too much information into this, but that's a war you don't have to worry about. Why? Because of communism and false teachings. They say there is no God or God is this or he is that. He's that stump over there. He's something else. God wants to show them, as it's written in Ezekiel 38, that he's God. He's going to fight that war all by himself. So that anyone, if they ever had any doubt that God exists, they will see, they will face it head on. They're going to find out he's very real. And so it is. Never leave God out of the equation of your life or you're in a heap of hurt, my friends. Now, let's go to the... We're going to still stay in Isaiah, but we're going to the New Testament. Don't let that confuse you. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 12 in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We're going to pick it up with verse 17. Verse 17 reads, continuing. This, this was when a, a big controversy over the Sabbath and it was written that Christ became our Sabbath. And he's making it clear in this particular chapter. Matthew 12, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. So we're still in Isaiah, okay? If you want to make a note, it's 42.1. Don't go there. We're going to read it right here from the New Testament. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, speaking of Christ, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, upon him. And he will show judgment to the Gentiles. That is to say, other than the house of Israel, he's going to show that love and protection to all of God's children. He shall not strive nor cry. You're not going to hear him whimper when they deliver him up. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. He, he doesn't make a lot of noise or anything. He just speaks the truth. Verse 20, a bruised reed shall he not break. I want to show you how gentle this is in the spiritual sense. You take an old reed and break it over, it's pretty fragile. If you shake that reed, it's liable to fall. He can handle it however he wants to without furthering the break. Okay. 
and smoking flax shall not be quenched till he send forth judgment into victory. Smoking flax is a wick in a lamp. You see, he's the light of the world. You're supposed to be a lamp of that light. And when, when you trim a wick of, and trim it, it makes a lot brighter light. But he can take scissors, I'll say, and trim that wick without ever putting the light out. Now that takes some doing. That's how gentle he is. Spiritually speaking, he's never going to dim your light unless you allow it to be dimmed. He's never going to allow the fire in you to be quenched. But that light, as long as you know his word and his truth and you make that stand, to know you're one of God's children. And God doesn't wake up every day and wondering, well, who can I zap today? No, he loves his children just like you love yours. And he wants the best for them if they'll behave. And, and um, he likes to lead, guide, and direct in a gentle way to those that love him, those that care. Verse 21, And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now, if, if we were reading this in Isaiah chapter 42, when we come here, it would say, and I will give him power to heal the blind and so on and so forth. I want you to see exactly what happens following his repeating this. Again, I'm going to say that lest it confuse you. If we had read these same scriptures from Isaiah 42, which is quoting, the very next verse would have said, and I will give him power to heal the blind. Watch what happens so that he was documenting to you that this scripture was coming to pass. Uh, and we pick it up in verse 19. Oh, I'm sorry. We pick it up in verse 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. It was to document that Isaiah 42 was being fulfilled at that moment. How precious it is to know your Sabbath. The Sabbath means rest in the Hebrew tongue. You're not going to have any rest if you don't know Christ. He became our Sabbath. If you've, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, it specifically states Christ became our Passover, which is the high Sabbath for Christianity. And how precious it is to follow that, to be with him, to be in him. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to serve the living God and to be pleasing to it. What does he expect from you? Turn with me then on over to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 6. And in Ephesians chapter 6, pick it up in the 10th verse. How, did, how does this apply to you? And, and uh, Paul teaching, Finally, brethren, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, as a Christian, I want you to know one thing. When you're at your weakest, all your strength comes from him and when you're weakest, he comes to help you when you're right. So then you become your strongest. So always remember that. When you're your weakest, turn to him and you're your strongest. Because we draw strength from him. He is our strength. That isn't, that isn't playing church. That's a reality. Christianity is not a religion. It is a reality. And um, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You can handle anything he can put out. If you put on the gospel armor, which is, we'll explain here in a moment just exactly what it is, piece by piece. Satan hasn't got a prayer of a chance with you. 
the moment of temptation, that's when, when many people are tempted by he as the false Christ, being Antichrist. But if you have the gospel armor on in place, you don't find him tempting. You find him to be an abomination, which he is. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That means even evil spirits and Satan trying to gnaw at your life, to change your life, to tempt you. Do you know something? He knows your weaknesses. He pays close attention. And many might say, well, well, I, I understand the word. Well, he does too. How did he tempt Christ in the wilderness? With scripture. Satan can quote more scripture than most Christians. Uh, but he always twists them about 90 degrees to make it a lie instead of the truth. Matthew 4 documenting that. Okay, so... so we have power over that darkness. That's why you put the gospel armor on. Well, make it real plain for us. So you're not taken in. So you're not made a fool of. By fancy tricks or sayings or lies that someone else can say. Because why? You know the truth. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day, that one coming we were talking about. And having done all, to stand. You've got to stand for something or probably you'll stand for nothing. You've got to be, you can't just say I'm a Christian. You've got to live it. Okay? It makes a difference. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, what is the girt? It's your belt. What are you supposed to use for a belt? Your belt holds your britches up. And truth is what does, or you'll lose your britches, all right? So learn truth from God's word and be strong. Put it on. You wear it well. Verse 15, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in other words, wherever you walk or wherever you go, you look for that peace. Christ is that peace. And you are to bring peace if possible. Don't, don't get on one of the, be one of these bleeding heart Christians that hasn't read God's word. It says get along with your neighbor if it's possible. It's not possible to get along with all neighbors, okay? You're not to be a, a welcoming mat for somebody to tromp on. Right? You're a man, woman, child of God. You act like it. Verse 16. Above all, the most important thing, taking the shield of faith. And Christ is that shield then. That faith, if you have faith in him, that shield will uh, turn off anything that anyone passes to you. As long as you use common sense. Wherewith you shall be able to quench. That's why we came here to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You can put them out. Satan tries to start a fire just like God. God's a consuming fire. Satan wants to be. Okay. But he gives you power to just puff him out. I mean, quench him, snuff him out, get it done. You do that by being familiar with his word and being armed with the, with the gospel armor, on and in place. And then you have nothing to worry about. There is uh, uh, fear, I guess, uh, a coward dies a thousand deaths, a brave man dies once. Everybody has p moments of, of being careful. That's our ability to, to sustain ourselves. But then you face it, and you face it head on. And uh, so that's the most important. You stand, and you make that stand uh, against those uh, fiery darts. Every one of them, all of them, it said, not part, all. 17, and take the helmet of salvation. When you got that, you're secure. And the sword of the Spirit, that's the Word, which is the Word of God. Man, it is, the Word of God arms you with knowledge and wisdom, whereby 
It guides your life, your family's life. It keeps the roughest stuff away because you know how to stomp on ants, okay? You know how to protect your family, and you take good care of them. 18, praying always. This is important. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of course, and watching thereunto with all preservation uh, and, um, and, uh, um, and uh, supplication for all saints. Uh, and, and so it is, beloved. Put it on. Wear it safely. You know, this is why so many are said to be naked in, in the, the great book of Revelation. Righteous acts puts on the armor of God and you're well clothed. As you read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8, your righteous acts form the weave, the very fine linen you wear in the eternity. Make a stand. Let our Father know you love him and that you're ready to serve him. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Why? He loves you. You're his child. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the word. Thank you, for Father, for the written word as well as your given word, Father, in prayer and thanksgiving. Be with each of these as they go forward, Father. Let them all be a blessing to all they come in contact with. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Use common sense, but it's very necessary for the body. And um, uh, in the Middle East especially, salt was a precious thing. Naturally, it is not part of our religion to put salt on a grave. But if you are familiar with salt and what it was used for, you know why they do that. It is a curing or a protecting. Always has been and always will be. Uh, before refrigeration, salt preserved meat even. So if, if it was bled properly. Uh, David from Tennessee. I find it hard sometimes to forgive others. What can help me with this? I think probably the last lecture that we taught in Matthew would be your help on that, where seven times 70, you know, and the parable following that in that chapter of the, the um, person that, uh, he was quite wealthy apparently because he owed 750 ounces of silver and he couldn't pay it. And, the father gave him a chance to, but he repented and didn't want to lose his family. I mean, this is how broad forgiveness can be. Lose, you can lose everything. But uh, God forgave him, and then he wouldn't forgive somebody that owed him a pit pittance. So forgiveness is important. But at the same time, don't ever let someone make a fool out of you. That, that goes with it as well. And uh, com, uh, spiritual discernment helps us in that. Sheila from North Carolina. My sister is reading a book that tells her the Old Testament is not valid. I would like to dispute this with her, but it would be wrong for me to read the. Would it be wrong for me to read the book first? Thank you. Uh, a good strong Christian can read anything if it is to help someone else, and it's not going to rub off on them. But you have. Uh, the word itself you don't you don't necessarily have to read the book but it would if it would help you to to um, conference with her then that would be that would be well but let's say what is it 
mean? What does it mean when Christ would be asked a question and he would say, "Haven't you read?" You see, when Christ walked the earth, there wasn't a New Testament. There was only the Old. There was only the scrolls from the Old Testament. And that's what Christ wanted you to read. And he quoted over and over and over again from those manuscripts. And one of the places most interesting to me is, would be Mark chapter 13 where Christ would say, when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's the appearance of the Antichrist. She doesn't want to know that from Daniel. Daniel is no good because somebody who writes a book to probably make money and throw people a curve like that is basically like bringing them to worship the devil. Because if you don't understand the Old Testament that speaks certainly of example Ezekiel 13 don't teach my children to fly to save their souls because there's not going it's not going to happen and and I'm against it but yet you'll have people teach people to fly to save their souls go directly against God's word so it's very important there is more about the millennium in the book of Ezekiel from chapter 40 to the end than there is in the whole New Testament so uh, your sister has been had, all right? So if you can help her, God bless you. That's great. Rick from Florida. My wife and I study with you every day for eight years. My cat is very sick with cancer, and we have been treating her with chemo for six months. Would it be considered premeditated murder if I had her put down? Oh, no, no. It would be considered love. Love for that pet that she didn't suffer. There's... Um, that, you know, when, when tough love is a hard thing sometimes, and it hurts. Tough love can hurt. But if, if, um, if it is terminal and there is no hope now, then um, she needs peace. And if you read Leviticus chapter 11, God loves animals. That's why he created them. And you notice that they also are in spiritual bodies in the millennium in heaven. And um, it, 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 it's tough, but it shows you love that pet. Don't you ever let somebody put you on a guilt trip for that. Albert from Iowa. About 30 years ago, I lost one of my twin daughters. I blame God for that. Now I realize God took her home. Should I ask the Father to forgive me for that? Also, how can I forgive myself? God bless all of you. Well, he sure does. And, um, you know... Um, Things happen, they do. And uh, when you read the uh, 14th chapter of Luke, the Tower of Siloam, it fell on 18 people. Were they sinners more above anyone else? No, they, it was an accident. It happened. So things do happen <clears throat> in this world. And, and, uh, but it is true, they are with the Father now. And will he forgive you? Seven times 70 490 times he loves you and you need to return that love and uh, I, I, I know that it must have been painful but um, she is with him and uh, in paradise and uh, how precious it is uh, repent and don't be on guilt trips for yourself okay you can accomplish more for our heavenly father if you repent he's going to forgive you okay he would understand in the first place. Anne from Virginia, I am very confused about the food laws. Which animals and shellfish are we not supposed to eat? Thank you so much for your program. You are welcome. The easiest way to remember, Leviticus chapter 11 lays it out for you if you can understand and recognize the animals and fish and so uh, birds. <clears throat> but don't eat scavengers. That's what it really comes down to. Well, are the scavengers bad? No, they're good. God created them to keep disease cleaned off this earth. Okay. They take, um, you take an old vulture. Uh, when something dies, he takes care of the remains and cleans it up. 
And uh, but the vulture is, is a he, he is uh, certainly uh, a scavenger, and you're not to touch. So best way to remember: don't eat scavengers. That that is to say, things that eat garbage and become garbage themselves. Sandy from Arkansas. In one program, you said you could fall so far away in sin you could go to hell. In another program, a lady asked, could you fall so far away in sin you would go to hell? And you said no. Which is it? Well, what did I follow it with? You can fall far enough away to go to hell and then repent and have salvation. Okay. And probably that's what I would have answered that lady. And you left that part off. But... If you fall away so far and do not repent, you're hell bound. If, if it's worthy of that, I'm not judging anyone, but uh, God certainly will. But on repentance, um, it will always bring you back to the cross, okay, back to forgiveness. Uh, Jenny from Illinois, when did the Catholic happen when, which, who, when I read Genesis? It went to Noah's flood and didn't mention the first earth age. Would you please uh, reply uh, to this? Because I think many people still want to know. God bless. Well, if you don't understand that first earth age, you see, when you read it and passed it in the first verse, the very first verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, period. It did not say when. But it was millions of years ago. And in verse 2, the Hebrew is very specific. Tuhu vavuhu, which is to say the earth wasn't created void. It became void and without form. Why? It's Satan's rebellion. Now, I, I want you, to, for your own benefit, I want you to make a note um, uh, of Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. I'll say it again. Isaiah 45, verse 18. What does it say? It says, God did not create this earth void. He created it to be inhabited. And then it became void because of the overthrow. All right? Uh, so you just be careful how you read, and you'll be fine. Uh, Keeney from Kansas. Ken from Kansas. I guess that would be pronounced. On your lecture CD, Matthew chapter 13, you said Satan was still in heaven and his evil spirits were cast down to earth. You also said read Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. I read it over and over thinking I may not understand it. The King James Bible says he was cast down to earth. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Well, what are your tenses? If you're not understanding the tenses, that, that would really throw you off. The 12th chapter of Revelation speaks when Satan and all of his bad angels are cast out onto the earth and know they have but a short time. His evil spirit has been with us ever since Christ condemned him and locked him in heaven with Michael holding him. Uh, but there is coming a time in the future tense when 12 will come to pass and he will be. It's the woe trump. That's when it said, woe to you on earth, because he's coming back down there. But his evil spirit has been with us um, from, from day one. Uh, Eddie from Texas, my question is, if Noah took two of mankind, how did, there have, how did there have been giants when David killed Goliath, which did the, where did the giant come from? If uh, God's flood, there was a second influx. Okay, your companion Bible on giants will will give you that second influx, uh, and uh, see, and um, that will assist you with that. Okay, uh, this would be Tina from Las Vegas. Question: Recently, there was a lecture about the genealogy of, genealogy of Jesus through Mary. If I understood correctly, it was stated Mary came from the line of Nathan, uh, Luke 3.31, priest line through the Levites. 
discussion. If Elizabeth and Mary are relatives, Luke 133, and she is from the line of Aaron, the priest line, Luke 1, 5, how can Mary be of Nathan? Well, read it again. It was Mary's father that was from Nathan of Judah, okay, of the tribe of Judah, the king line. It was Mary's father. Mary's mother was a, a um, uh, sister to um, Elizabeth, uh, which made uh, a mother, which is to say of the tribe of Aaron. And this explains the order of Melchizedek, if you would receive it. In other words, Mary's father was of Judah, Mary's mother was a Levite, and God was the father. So you have King of Kings and Lord of Lords, rightfully so and clear as a bell, okay? I hope that I hope that clears it up for you. Again, it was Mary's father that was of Judah. Mary's mother was a Levite because her and Elizabeth, who was a full-blood Levite, uh, were married to a Levitical priest, uh, were cousins. Uh, Luke chapter 1. Rookie from, from uh, Missouri. Question, is the lake of fire a real lake or a lake as in a lake of people? How would would turn to ashes within a lake of fire. I, P.S. I, I know I'm going to heaven. Well, that's what's most important. Uh, the thing you want to remember concerning the lake of fire is what is one of God's names? You can read of it in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 12, the last verse. It states there that God is a consuming fire. The Old Testament states the same thing. Which means God can speak and nothing can become everything. Or God can speak and he can blot out, consume with fire from on high, the Holy Spirit. And speak and something becomes nothing. It's blotted out. So I have a work titled uh, um, Hellfire and God the Consuming Fire. I don't know what the number is. I cannot remember, but... It might help you. Okay, um, Carolyn from Kentucky. And Carolyn says, Hi, my name is Carolyn from Kentucky. I have a question. What does God think about people who breaks into churches? Is there a verse on that? Or what do you think about this? Uh, we have a lot of churches have been broken into, and I have been watching you for a while. Well, it's, that's real sad. It truly is. But naturally, Exodus chapter 20 gives the Ten Commandments, and one of them is, Thou shall not steal. Another is, Thou shall not covet your neighbor's property. And somebody must be very bold that wants to covet God's property, because churches are God's property, necessarily. But um, it's... Um, Quite easily with modern technology, if you have somebody in the neighbor, the vicinity, that knows how to set up uh, warning devices, such as uh, cameras, um, uh, detection of motion, uh, it's pretty easy to catch somebody like this. Uh, they're not too bright or they wouldn't be breaking into churches and they really need to be caught. I, I would think that the local um, sheriff's department would have the technology to assist in this, and you have, should have some elders go to them and, or let the elders do it on their own. I always like to take care of my own problems, personally, if it's possible. And with today's technology, that would be an easy one to identify who it is. Uh, Carol from Vermont, uh, please explain something for me. Does God know if we are going to love him and follow his ways? No, he doesn't. That's why he gives you free will, because why? He wants you to love him. He cannot force you to love him or it's not the real thing. He can't pay you to love him. It's still not the real thing. I ask this because I've heard you say he was, he has blinded some people from the truth. I assume because he already knows they won't follow him in this age. No, you misunderstand. He blinds them because he loves them. 
he, he blinds them from knowing the truth because when you know the truth, you are accountable. Only God's elect, I would assume, and those that have been taught and know what's happening, uh, can withstand Satan without deception. But he is so convincing that some people would fall, and that would be, if they came into full knowledge, it would be unforgivable. So God blinds them so they're not put in that position, and then in the millennium, they will have an opportunity to be taught. It is because God loves his children, and he does sense and know who is weak, and he knows by election who is strong. Bates from Michigan. I'm having trouble understanding the Bible. How can I understand it better? Um, Faith, age 10 from Michigan. Well, bless your heart. You, you're, you're doing real good, I would say, because you're studying. And it will come to you in the simplicity in which Christ teaches it. Um, as soon as you're in a position where you can, get you a strong concordance and go all the way back to the new language, the old languages, when you have that opportunity. But you're doing good. You keep studying, and God's going to bless you. It makes him real happy when you study. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. It makes his day. When you study the letter he has sent to you to help you please him, to protect yourself, your family, those you love, and to be blessed of God. That's why he wants you to handle that letter. Why? Again, because he loves you. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan.